Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Mark Nykirk, the director of the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement at NKU, and I want to welcome our in-person audience and our virtual audience. Uh, I will tell you that we have a relatively small in-person audience. I think everybody's still a little COVID nervous, but uh, I think we have a substantial uh, virtual audience. So thanks everybody for being with us. Uh, this is the last of our Six at Six series this uh, season. We have focused on democracy and um, it's been a good uh, season, a little interesting because uh, life is interesting right now, right? Uh, but uh, thanks for being with us. Although this is our last uh, 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 Six at Six lecture for the season, it's not our last event with our community partners. So I want to tell you about a few things that are upcoming uh, next uh, week on April the 21st, which is Thursday at 9 a.m. in the Student Union. Uh, we will have a panel discussion, uh, Ukraine Voices. We have faculty, staff, and some alumni who uh, have direct ties to Ukraine and we want to have a chance for uh, the community to hear about uh, the personal toll that the war is taking on friends and family uh, and talk about what we are able, might be able to do. Uh, Friday, the next day at 7 p.m. Uh, in Greaves Hall uh, here on campus, uh, two musicians who came from Ukraine and uh, were um, uh, on scholarship at NKU uh, graduated in 2005. Uh, went to New York for careers in, uh, as pianists. They are now married. Uh, uh, will be back uh, to play uh, a concert. Uh, and that is a ticketed event and all proceeds go to Ukrainian release. So if you can join us that evening. The very next evening uh, uh, on April the 23rd on uh, Saturday, uh, we ha are partnered with Kentucky Humanities uh, to bring two uh, special guests to campus, uh, the National Poet Laureate uh, Joy Harcho and Kentucky's Poet Laureate uh, Crystal Wilkinson to uh, read and talk about their uh, poetry. That is a free event, but it uh, is also a uh, re request an, uh, an RSVP. Uh, the uh, Ukrainian uh, music concert, by the way, you can find information on NKU's homepage. Uh, the Ukrainian Voices, uh, you can find information at nkyforum.org. Uh, and the laureates, uh, if you look at the Kentucky Humanities homepage, you'll find information and a place to um, uh, RSVP. A little further out, but just uh, so that you uh, uh, know about them, on May the 5th at 9.30 in the morning at the Boone County Public Library in Hebron, uh, Matt Ruther, who is Kentucky's demographer, uh, will be interpreting the latter, latest census data. Uh, that uh, up is with the Northern Kentucky Forum, and so you can also uh, RSVP to that at nkyforum.org. That session uh, tends to be particularly popular with people that are involved in the nonprofit world or in politics because the census data uh, informs a lot of uh, how we do grant applications and, of course, uh, how we do districting for uh, political uh, legislative districts. And then on May the 18th, uh, 24 hours after the uh, May primary, the forum will host a uh, discussion of the results of the primary uh, and looking forward to the November election. So uh, a lot of things coming up, but let's uh, focus on uh, tonight. Uh, first, I do want to thank Kentucky Humanities, who is our co-host tonight. Uh, uh, Kentucky Humanities, like us, has been focusing on democracy this year, and so they have uh, uh, agreed to uh, help us uh, get the word out. Uh, so we have uh, some guests, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, regionally, but also from around the state. Uh, so welcome everybody from downstate in Kentucky. Uh, we're glad to have you with us. Um, uh, one uh, uh, important preliminary on questions. Uh, we have a mic here for the uh, in-person audience. And if you're joining us virtually, just put, type your question into the Q&A function. We will monitor those and ask the uh, questions. We'll be getting to questions just around 7 o'clock or a little after, uh, and we will go until 7.30. Uh, tonight's uh, um, presentation, uh, uh, our, our lead presenter, if you will, and I, I suspect he would not like me to say lead presenter because he's very uh, inclusive, and I, so I, I'll retract that, but uh, uh, Dr. Chris Wil Wilkie is a professor of English with a long-standing commitment to something that NKU believes in deeply, and that's connecting our classrooms to the community. 
Dr. Wilkie and his students have focused their work on community voices, and particularly in Over the Rhine, and as you can see tonight, we'll not hear a lecture per se from Dr. Wilkie, but instead we'll hear from the residents and activists that he and his students have worked with, and I will let uh, Dr. Wilkie do the introductions of those, and the mic is yours. Thank you, everyone, and remember, Q&A and the Q&A function. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, as Mark was saying, uh, I have a lot of experience uh, doing work in the neighborhood of Over the Rhine. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, Over the Rhine is a, a neighborhood in the center, center city of, of Cincinnati, uh, just north of downtown. Um, and in that space, uh, for a number of years now, I've had the pleasure and the privilege of being able to teach a course in that neighborhood involving students directly in contact and in engagement with uh, activists and residents in, in the neighborhood. <clears throat> As Mark was saying, um, I'm not really interested in doing a, a lecture. <laughs> so what I've done is uh, I gathered, gathered some of the folks over the years that I've worked with. This is just a small uh, kind of glimpse into the, the people um, that I'm working with. And so let me just kind of do a little bit of a um, navigation of the panel itself. Of course, I'm going to start off, and I'll basically give some background, provide a context for the panel, uh, describe a little bit about community writing and how that fits into the work in Over the Rhine. Then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Brian Bailey, who's an associate professor of community writing at University of, uh, University of Cincinnati at Blue Ash. Uh, Brian uh, is going to talk about the, a community press. We're in the process now of developing a community press where we can publish uh, the works that involve the people in the community. Then we'll turn it over to Bonnie Newmeyer. Bonnie's a long-term uh, activist in the neighborhood, pushing, I guess, almost 50 years or so now in the neighborhood. Um, and she's going to have some of her writings that she's going to read uh, and share with all of you folks. And then we'll turn it over to the Street Vibes team. Uh, street Vibes is a street newspaper um, that's based in Cincinnati, um, works out of the neighborhood of Over the Rhine. That will be uh, Gabriella Gutinas, Ferragino, uh, we call her Gabby for short, um, and then Dr. Caitlin Lusher. Uh, Gabby is the editor-in-chief of, of Street Vibes, and, and Kat, uh, Kat, Caitlin, I should say. Caitlin has created a uh, Street Vibes archive, which basically archives all the back issues of the street newspaper, um, which has been in publication since, I guess, 19... Uh, 1997 now. So that is all digitally being collected in a, in a website um, that's being available to the public. Uh, then we'll turn over to June, Miss June uh, Alexander, a, a long-term resident um, and um, community activist in the neighborhood. She's going to read some of her works, give you a flavor of, of her voice and what she's done with uh, writing. And then we'll turn it finally to Janiah Miller, who is an alum of uh, alumni of NKU, and she was able to take the, the course with me in Over the Rhine a few years ago, um, and has gone on to do great and wonderful stuff um, involving activism in, in, city, in the city of Cincinnati. And she's going to share uh, her work on a, an affordable housing campaign um, that just happened over the last year or so. Uh, and she'll look at it through a community writing lens um, to give you a sense of, of how that works itself out in terms of community writing. So to kind of set this up, this is something I always do when I talk about the neighborhood. Um, and a lot of times, this, this kind of schematic I have here about the neighborhood in terms of narratives, I think makes a lot of sense to folks from greater Cincinnati or in northern Kentucky. If, you've, you know, if you're born in this region, um, if you're from this region, um, you've, you've, chances are you probably are familiar with the, with the name Over the Rhine or what we call OTR sometimes. Uh, and there's actually two different narratives that I like to point out to students. Uh, when, I, when I teach my course uh, in Over the Rhine. The two dominant narratives are what we call the poverty narrative and the urban renaissance narrative. And so the poverty, poverty narrative is that, that kind of story of the neighborhood that, again, a lot of us who are from this region kind of associate with that neighborhood. Um, it's, it's seen as a, uh, it's the story of the neighborhood as, as crime-ridden, as, as full of blight, underdevelopment. Um, it's where the, the poor people live. Um, it's, it's, it's what we see when we watch the 11 o'clock news and, and, and find out all the crime. And, and a lot of us who are from the suburbs, kind of, that's our image of, of the neighborhood. And historically, that's been the case you know, going on 50 years or so or now, 
about 50 years or so. The more recent narrative is the one that's predominant in a lot of ways now. It's what I call the urban renaissance narrative. It's the story of the neighborhood and its rebirth and its progress, right? Um, you know, over the last 15 years, particularly over the last five years, over the Rhine has increasingly become a, um, a trendy place to be, right? It's where the bars are, it's where the entertainment district is in Cincinnati now. And so um, it's a place that's fashionable and people are very excited to be in the neighborhood because of that. And so you have these two different narratives. You have the poverty narrative and the urban renaissance narrative. And I always like to point out that this urban renaissance narrative um, works very well in tandem with the poverty narrative. Because what happened before the renaissance, right? We all, we all know what happened before the renaissance. It was called the dark ages, right? And so before the renaissance and the gentrification that's been happening over the last 15 years happened, it was the Dark Ages. And so the urban renaissance becomes a way to kind of save the neighborhood, right? Um, and you can see how that story works to erase a third narrative. And that's the third narrative is what we call the Over the Rhine People's Movement narrative. And this is the story of how people on the economic margins have continually come together to act collectively, to live, flourish, and advocate for each other nobly and successfully under extreme difficult material uh, circumstances. And so this is the story that my students are introduced to and that this is the story that a lot of them aren't really familiar with, particularly if they grew up in this region. Uh, here's a quote, uh, a quote by Bonnie, uh, which I like to share a lot. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll just call uh, attention to the last line by uh, Bonnie, which says, the first, we have always said in our effort, the first step out of oppression is expression. Right? So these are community activists who are trying to um, give voice to their struggles and to their concerns. And that last uh, clause there, the first step out of oppression is expression, is a direct reference to this idea of writing and giving voice through language. The second quote is by um, Nanny Hinskin. Nanny Hinskin was a longtime activist in the neighborhood. And she has this famous quote, which has circulated for decades um, in the neighborhood. This is when there was pressure and there still is pressure, but there was a lot of pressure in the 90s to, to develop the neighborhood. And so she had the quote, we want to see development, but we don't want to be pushed out, right? And so uh, one of the dominant kinds of um, uh, ideologies or, or perspectives that were going around in the neighborhood and in the city at that time was that the people's movement, the people associated with the people's movement were against development, right? And here she's proclaiming, no, we're not against development. We just would like to be part of it. Right? If we're going to develop this place, we don't want to, we want to be able to live here. Right? And forces and things like gentrification you know, uh, work to displace folks. This right here is just a screenshot of a website. We call it the Over the Rhine Community Writing Collaborative, which is uh, a group that we've started here and kind of represents the work that I've involved students in over the years. And um, this is a website that we have. It's a portal for writing in the neighborhood. And this right here is kind of the mission statement of the, of the collaborative. And I'll just draw attention to um, a few of the things here, uh, the bullet or the bold face uh, statements here. Uh, we're encouraging act, active engagement with residents and community activists. Uh, we're encouraging literacy skills, developing literacy, but as a way to help narrate the, the history of the neighborhood and the, the perspectives of the neighborhood. And we're about informing and educating people beyond the neighborhood to the greater Cincinnati area to understand um, the policy issues and how they impact um, the residents. And then finally, enhancing service, academic, and cultural programs. Again, this idea that writing, community writing, is a kind of art a practice. It's an artistic practice, right? And, and so uh, the collaborative as a whole is about uh, gathering people together to engage in writing activities that are designed to help benefit and um, improve the conditions of people who live there. This right here is just a, you know, a, just a good picture. A lot of what we do at the collaborative in the class that I teach is have writing groups where we have students working together hands-on with people in the neighborhood. And here's an example from uh, a writing group that was part of the class from a few years ago. And the key thing I want to point out here is the individual right here, that's, uh, Al, that's Ron English. Mr. Ron English is telling his story, right? He's written something, he's telling the, the story to the students, and the, the, power, the, the, the kind of power dynamic I would like to call attention here is that we, through this course, are, are, are able to help position people like 
uh, Mr. Ron English as actual mentors to the students. So the students aren't there to mentor and to improve the writing of the residents. The residents are there to actually mentor the students by telling their stories and educating the students so that they learn um, the literacy practices that the people in the neighborhood already possess, right? And so that their literacy practices, their ways of writing is an asset, right? And so Mr. Ron English is the mentor in that scenario. And here I'm just gonna call attention to a, a newspaper um, that goes all the way back to the 50s, total ad hoc, grassroots, what we now would think of as a newsletter. Um, it was called Voices. It started in the late 60s, 1969 or so, all the way up to about 1983 or so. Um, you guys ever hear of ditto machines? You know, that's basically how these things were, were put together before digital technologies. And people like Bonnie were um, publishing this paper. And what you see up here on the screen is uh, kind of the statement um, of admission of the paper, and I'll, I'll just say that the people in the neighborhood at this time um, were seeing their work as larger expressions of global issues, right? It wasn't just simply local issues that were being addressed. Yes, local issues were being addressed, but, but as expressions of the, the larger issues that are going on in the world, particularly during the late 60s, or, uh, all the way through the 70s and into the early 80s. And this, um, this paper is something I share with my students. We, we research it, we look at it, and notice the issues here. Here's a reference to the drop-in center, which is a, a homeless shelter, the first one in Cincinnati. Um, and you can see that things like welfare rights, um, prison, prisoner advocacy was part of the issues. Of course, affordable housing was the big one. Um, and here we have the prisoner uh, notes and poetry people's poetry and letters, more people's poetry, welfare rights, I guess I've already mentioned that, there it is again, uh, people in struggle. And finally, I'll just end here, the idea of a community press. We are in the process of, um, of creating this press in partnership with NKU, and the idea is that we're gonna have an independent press. It's gonna be a press that is gonna be independent with its own board, and um, the board will be made up of residents and community activists in Over the Rhine, and the idea is that we would like to publish books on a regular basis, maybe starting off with one, maybe two a year, and um, as you can see, some bullet points here in terms of what our mission is a, as a community press, and um, notice that it's not just about disseminating stories for the sake of disseminating stories, it's really about disseminating stories, right, in writing, but in order to, um, engage, in, to, to engage in activism. So we're hoping that the, the books that come from this actual press will be used as tools for activism and, actual as, and also as, uh, as tools for community education uh, out in the community, um, in, in over the Rhine, but also um, well beyond the neighborhood, um, something that we would like to spread out, you know, maybe even globally, if possible. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brian, and Brian will talk more about this idea of a community press and how that fits into what we're doing. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Brian Bailey. Uh, I'm an associate professor. Ew, it's not on? Hmm. No, it's on. <clears throat> it's not close enough. How, how about now? A better. Put it up higher. Put it up higher? Okay. All right, so there we go. Is that better? Everybody hear me now? All right, so thank you for your patience. Um, I'm not used to working with a mic, and he's talking really loud. So anyways, my name is Brian Bailey. I'm an associate professor of English and community writing at the University of Cincinnati Blue Ash. And as Chris and I were talking about this concept and coming up with the talk itself and setting up the panel, uh, it occurred to us that we probably need to talk about what a community press is. Some folks know what it is. Uh, a lot of folks don't. So I'm going to describe it by talking about popular presses and university presses, right? So popular press is driven by marketable sorts of books and genres, correct? Right? So they go ahead with the idea of making a profit. So what they do is they will only promote books and writers that fit what's come before. So for instance, and I'm not off my pop lit, if you are an academic you understand, you don't have a lot of free time to read and have fun reading. Um, but if you don't know that, we don't. We don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to pull back to my time as a teenager when I would read, say, Stephen King and Dean Coots. The reason there could be a Stephen King and a Dean Coots is because horror was a profitable genre. 
There could be multiple writers writing in that particular genre. So what ends up happening there is you have the idea of an institution who's also defining things about like what is the voices that get out there? What are the voices, excuse me, that get out there? What's read? What genres are important? What topics come up? How are the issues addressed that are going on around us? And again, this is a private institution that is for profit. They also mystify the publishing process and the fact that they have multiple, multiple people working for them. The large publishing houses have huge departments and they have multiple specialized jobs. And so when your writer finishes writing, what they do is they turn that over and it's sent away, right, to an, a, a place that has no face. And if they're lucky, if it's accepted, then what ends up happening is it comes back to them with some notes and they make the revisions. So in total, that is not a very democratic process, right? There is somebody in a position of authority deciding like what is going to be offered to you to give the illusion of choice. You can have a Dean Coots or you can have a Stephen King. That's what you get, right? The other press that I would like to discuss, and uh, some of you academics in the room and online probably have worked with some of these folks before, are university presses. Now, they're not necessarily driven by profit, but they fetishize uh, credentialing, right? You have to be the, you have to have the right terminal degree to write for a specific uh, series of books. Uh, you have to have a CV. You have to be a known quantity within your field. There's going to be lots of peer review. There's going to be lots of reading. Um, in my experience, although I haven't worked with the press, one day maybe, hopefully, but at least from what I understand about academic journals, excuse me, and working with them, you send it out, it comes back with revisions notes. You send it out, reviewer two still hates it. You send it, you revise it again, you send it back, reviewer two still hates it. So it's a long process. And so again, what you end up getting though is that there are a series of gatekeepers, right? Most people cannot get published through a university press they don't have that terminal degree. Again, not a democratic process. There is a group of people who have credentials, they have standards that they've defined within their own disciplines or their own businesses, and they get to decide. They get to decide who gets to write, who gets to speak. Now, this is what I'm gonna to do to define a community press, to say community presses are completely different, okay? First off, we don't do it for the money. We run on a shoestring budget. And there are other community presses out there, right? And we hope to be similar. We're not reinventing the wheel. We're building off of what's already come before us. The idea, like Chris was saying, is maybe two books a year, right? Mostly driven by grant you know, money that we'll have to write grants for. Get ready for that, Chris. <laughs> and we aren't getting paid, right? Because we're academics. We have no commercial gain from it. Therefore, we must be doing something good. Because we just donate time unless they believe in the concept. The other thing is that the writers don't have to have specialized credentials. And they don't have to have that fetishized American standard edited English. So both of those presses usually promote that, right? To an extent, not so much in the fiction stuff, right? Especially when it comes to dialogue. But with university presses, you have to have that American standard English. And you have to speak in American standard English, or write, I should say, in American standard English, that's specific and filled with the jargon for the discipline you're hoping to get published in. We don't want that. Much like we were talking about with Mr. English, we want to make the community writer, the author that we're hoping to make, we want to make them the source of knowledge. We don't want to push them down because of the Englishes or the English that they use or the languages they use if it's not English. We want to keep it uh, real, for lack of a better phrase, and we want, to be, we want to let them describe what they see, what they feel, the connections they're making between the real world and the personal experience, that critical literacy that Chris was talking about. And so for us, as we start, everybody here, as we work on starting that community press, one of the big things ends up being that this is a way for us to continue what we've already been doing, or I should say, what the folks from OTR have already been doing. For years, they've done little d-democracy right? Participatory democracy, and they've had great results. They've established things like Shelter House, the Peasley Center, um, uh, and even uh, OTRCH, right? Over the Rhine Community Housing. These are social safety nets built by the neighborhood for the neighborhood, funded by the neighborhood either through fundraising drives or through things like writing grants. And this is what we actually want to, this is what we want to bring to the press. And in that way, what we're hoping to do is, like Chris was saying, share those stories that people have, to share their experiences, but to also open up who gets to write, who gets to be considered an author, who is an expert. 
So not only that style of writing, but also the stories that also come out from those oral histories about organizing, especially from our elders in the community. How did this start? Where did voices start? Right? Because we want to be able to broadcast that type of community organizing and activism. We want to share those, those methods. Now, for me personally, uh, one of the things that, uh, and I think Chris as well, one of the reasons that we are sort of in the meta sense, what we come from is this idea of use value, which also makes us more democratic. So I'm not going to go into the whole definition of use value. Uh, look up Karl Marx um, or read you know, one of his works. Um, but we, uh, we're, we're akin, I think, in our thinking about use value more along what the Canadian, I believe he's Canadian scholar, G.A. Cohen talked about with use value. It's the idea that use value for workers, that is for the laborers, that is the authors, the writers, they actually get to control their product, their commodity once they produce it. Again, that's the democratic process. Writers are involved at every level. Let me give you an example. Most of our writers, most of our authors write, like you saw with Chris's presentation, using a group setting. And what we imagine happening is the idea that they'll work in those group settings and that they'll be giving each other revision and feedback notes. Right? And one of us, some representative, either Chris or myself or someone else that we've selected, will be there also giving feedback and revision notes. And then from there, what ends up happening is those folks are included through the entire publishing process. So we're not just talking about they, they submit and then it goes away and then it mystically comes back with notes. They're actually a part of that process. And it continues on because we'll talk about like, how are we going to circulate it? Where do you want it to show up? How much is it going to be sold for? What are we going to do with it if, if we turn a profit on it? Right, what's going to happen to those profits? Are we going to donate it back to something? What's going to happen? So involving the individual author, the writer, in that process is something you don't see with university and uh, pop presses. And that's something we want to do. That's something that we want to make possible. Because again, that's little d democracy. That's the extension of what they've been doing and over the Rhine for 40 to 50 years now. And so this is what we really are pushing towards, is the idea that we are disrupting traditional literature and the publishing of literature. Even what gets counted as literature. Who is counted as an author? right? Who's knowledgeable? And we want to share those methods that oftentimes you won't find in mainstream America for organizing people. People who often are on the margins. People who often don't have a voice. And so we're taking on this, this publishing industry through this sort of writing. And in this way, hopefully, what we'll do is we also create readers, new readers who want to read these new voices, new readers who are suddenly given new topics, new issues, new ways of thinking about issues, thinking about the books that we, that we actually print as sort of a space to grapple with these concepts of American politics of socioeconomic class in the United States, of the concept of poverty, the concept of dignity, of the concept of the working poor, of the working class, right? of even the idea of challenging those ideas of cultural institutions, excuse me, commercial institutions being cultural gatekeepers, private, non-democratic sources uh, that decide what we as reading, as a reading public, get to read and, uh, and to consume. So that's the big overview when it comes to what a community press does and what we hope to do with the OTR community press. This is really short, and there's a lot of stuff to talk about with this particular topic. So if you want to talk more with me, and I tend to keep things public so that way it's always out in the open, you can find me on Twitter at this Twitter handle, BJ Bailey. So B J B A I L I E. It's spelled funny. And even if you don't want to talk, let's say you're interested in this and you want to know like, what is the literature that uh, Chris and I are using to uh, start this project, to base our founder project on, the, the project that we're all hopefully going to be doing very soon, right? that we'll have up and running, um, let me know. And I can send you a, a list of sources. I've got lots of them. I've got lots of books for you to read if you want them. Okay. Now, that's enough from me. I am uh, I'm really not that important. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the talk. And uh, Bonnie Newmar is next. OK, can you hear me? OK, 
Okay, good. Um, good evening. I've just got a few pieces that I picked of things that I've written. This is just a short piece called Solace on My Porch. It kind of says a little bit about who I am, I guess. I find solace on my third floor porch hanging over West 14th Street and over the Rhine, my home for nearly 50 years. I'm lucky to live in an old-fashioned apartment where I can step out and greet the morning air or visit the night sky. When I dress my porch in the spring with colorful annuals, complete joy washes over my body. My perennials living in corners in my home are lifted to the porch, seeking nourishment from the soon summer sun. The act of filling up my small watering can traveling in and out of the screen door to replenish the water is a morning ritual I need and treasure. When I tend to my plants, my soul is happy. Nurturing my plants is nurturing me. I get excited to see the blossoming colors of purple, red, pink, yellow, and orange, colors that drown out despair and desolation. My fingers tenderly touch my plants and pinch off the dead ends so more flowers will bloom. I feel I have some control over their growth if I tend to the plants kindly. I want over the rind to bloom. Bloom for whom? For those who have experienced so many dead ends. I want our people to be touched with kindness given abundant opportunities to blossom, not pinched off the map. There are memories in my potted plants. The old tin coffee can that Buddy used on his stove is perfect for one beautiful impatience plant. The red tea kettle that Miss Mildred gave me can hold a pansy. Dad's ivy and Mom's coleus, I work to keep them alive so their love is palpable. Tending plants brings me home to my roots. My hand in dirt is my lived experience. Hands in dirt keeps me grounded with my working class roots. It reminds me to never forget where I came from. Our family was always gardening to keep food on the table. My ancestors worked the land as farmers. Working in the dirt passed on perseverance in my blood. I was taught one doesn't give up hope when something you've seeded doesn't come to fruition. There is wisdom in the act of seeding, even if it never bears fruit. And another thing I brought you, we often get asked to speak at rallies at City Hall or anything like that. So I mean, you got to be a writer to do those kinds of things. So this is a piece that I wrote for May Day um, a few years ago. You and I, the people, the mothers, the fathers, the cooks and cashiers, the nurses' aides, the teachers, the janitors, bricklayers, stadium cleaners, the dishwashers, childcare assistants, maintenance workers, street sweepers, we are what keeps this city going but it is getting harder to provide for our families to make ends meet because we are not earning a living wage or getting cheated out of our just wages or suffering through loss of jobs and unemployment. Without a living wage, workers can't find affordable housing. And currently there is a crisis of affordable housing in our city and across our nation. More and more families are on waiting lists to find affordable housing. Affordable housing is a basic human right. In my neighborhood of Over the Rhine, what I'm seeing is not good. There's a quote by Eduardo Galeano, the Uruguayan writer activist who died not long ago. He said, development is developing inequality. I can certainly relate to that Development in Over the Rhine is developing inequality. Those of us making low wages can't afford the rents developers are charging. The gap between the wealthy and the poor is widening. Even those who make a decent pay are saying housing has gotten out of reach here. 
Condominiums and 500,000 single-family homes are displacing us. There is a recent development up across our Rothenburg School that calls for taking basketball hoops away from our kids to make way for the upscale housing, which none of our families can afford. We've already lost our basketball courts and swimming pool in Washington Park. It's our African-American children being told to find recreation elsewhere. Whose families are suffering the brunt of displacement? Black lives matter. We can't allow for corporate developers to set the agenda for our city. It's not right. We put our sweat, tears, and labor in this soil. We have a right to live out our lives here. Folks in other neighborhoods are now saying, we don't want to be over the rind. But let me tell you, this kind of unethical development backed by big money can spread. None of us are safe from the spread of greed and land grab. We've got to build solidarity with each other and take back our city. The low wage worker, the immigrant forced to work under the table, the woman with children on the street experiencing homelessness, the union man trying to recruit more members, the housing advocate working to diminish the cries for not in my backyard, the African-American child who wants to play basketball in a public space. We need to see our interests are connected and build on our solidarity. We need policies that protect us. We are not obstacles to clear out. We are human beings with hearts who care deeply about this place, this city we call home. In another poem I wrote, it's called, I Wish for That Kind of Trust. The morning dove, with her two babies, born two days ago, sits quietly in my hanging basket on my porch. I respect her choice of home. I say hello in the mornings to reassure her I mean her no harm. Her mother's eye looks at me suspiciously. I can understand that suspicion, but I have noticed she trusts me now. She knows I won't harm her. I wish for that kind of trust. I want to believe it's possible to live with difference. Developers don't quite get our suspicion. We have reason not to trust. We have a record of harms. It doesn't have to be that way. When will those in power learn you can't just push your way onto others because you have the power to do so? And this is just a personal piece. I wrote this after my mom's death. It's called Missing Mom in My Oatmeal. Mom is in the oatmeal I eat for breakfast. It's all she wanted, a watered-down bowl of oatmeal, no raisins or cinnamon to dress it up, just plain. My tears are salty, remembering her at the end of the kitchen table, sitting alone with her oatmeal, eating less and less, her words minimal without honey. At daybreak, standing alone at the kitchen counter, I hear a morning dove's coo singing my grief while I sweeten up my cereal with dried pieces of apricot, missing mom in my oatmeal. Hi, we're here to talk about Street Vibes. My name is Gabriela Godinez Peregrino, and I'm the editor-in-chief, as 
was said earlier. <laughs> and I'm Dr. Caitlin Lusher. I am the Street Vibes archivist and I am also a frequent uh, contributing writer to Street Vibes. Um, yeah, that's who we are. <laughs> Um, so let's talk first about what street papers are in general before we dig deeper into Street Vibes itself. Um, Caitlin knows more about the history, obviously, since she's the archivist. Yeah, so uh, street papers are, uh, like Street Vibes, are definitely not uh, confined only to Cincinnati. Um, it is not the only street paper uh, in the country or even the world, um, in case you didn't know that. Uh, but so what street papers are, well, Gabby will uh, talk about, like, you know, what they do exactly, but how um, they developed was actually in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, there were a lot of anti-panhandling legislations being uh, proposed in, you know, nationwide and in the cities all over the country. And um, so basically it was making it so that like people who had no other option to earn money, you know, and were, you know, getting money on the streets were being arrested. And uh, that makes it even harder for people to get off the streets because once they have a record, they can't get, it's harder to get a job, it's harder to get a place to stay. And so it was really just like kind of perpetuating this very vicious cycle. So uh, the first street paper was Street News in New York City, and that was in the late 80s. Uh, unfortunately, that no longer exists. Um, the next, uh, probably the, the next uh, oldest paper that is still around is Street Sheet in San Francisco. Uh, Street Vibes was founded in 1997, so that actually makes it one of the oldest continuously publish, publishing uh, street papers in the country. And um, kind of like what Chris was talking about earlier, he uh, was talking about how there was a lot of pressure in the 90s to develop over the Rhine. And um, that's very much reflected in Street Vibes. Um, you know, there was a lot of pre pressure all across the country, not just for anti-panhandling legislation, but also a lot of pressure to gentrify areas and the kind of like fix, you know, so-called urban blight. Um, and uh, Voices, uh, the paper that Chris was talking about earlier, was sort of a predecessor to Street Vibes in a lot of ways. And Street Vibes has kind of taken the torch for that. Um, Street Vibes also takes on global and local issues, and uh, Voices is, you know, sort of like a, a way to store like activist history, and Street Vibes has also fulfilled that function. Um, but yeah, so what Street Papers do, especially Street Vibes, is um, essentially make it possible for people who are experiencing homelessness to have um, a source of income, and um, for also people to get their voices out there. Yeah, so uh, Street Vibes specifically, um, people will come into the uh, Homeless Coalition, the Cincinnati, the Greater Cincinnati Homeless Coalition. Um, in the before times, pre-pandemic, people would come into the lobby. Um, but now we just have the mail window because the coalition also distributes mail to people experiencing homelessness uh, who don't have an address. So in that same window, people will come in, um, buy a paper for 75 cents, as many as they want. If they have contributed to the paper, meaning they've written something for the paper, they get 10, 10 free papers. Um, and then they will go out and distribute the paper for a chit, $2 donation, but sometimes they get more. And like was mentioned, uh, this will not get somebody out of poverty, um, but it does supplement income um, because it's really up to them according to their schedule and what they need. Um, a lot of times people experiencing homelessness, if they have a caseworker, they're really at the mercy of everyone else, the agencies that can fit them in. Um, and this really gives people the the ability to get some sort of income and not have to explain all the time, I have to leave, I have to leave, I have to leave. Um, the International Network of Street Papers, we are a member of that network um, because street papers are all over the country but also all over the world. Um, so we talk to each other a lot, we talk about strategies to um, retain distributors, uh, retain writers, because Street Vibes specifically is primarily run through volunteer work. I'm the only paid staff member for the entire paper. 
<laughs> so that's a lot of work. <laughs> Obviously, it's a 16-page paper that comes out every two weeks. So it would not be possible if volunteers didn't give their time for editing, give their time to actually write pieces. Um, but the international network of street papers really supplements uh, our pages. That's how we have a global section. That's how we have a US section. Um, we also get a lot of information from the national coalition. There's a coalition page in our paper as well. Um, and then we also have a street voice paper, meaning that's poetry, creative writing, creative nonfiction, um, anything that's a little bit more beyond the, the scope of uh, an article or an essay. But even in our essays, uh, we do not adhere to um, standard American English or also known as white American English. Um, if you write it a certain way, we are going to edit it for clarity, but not for um, any specific type of jargon. So we're obviously going to try to get that piece the best it can be, um, but we're working with that writer to make sure that it's still in their voice. So there's no standardized voice. In newspapers at large, there's usually an institutional voice. Street papers don't have that. Um, that was the origin of a lot of different street papers, um, but if you uh, Google INSP, you'll see that a lot of street papers have kind of turned more towards entertainment, less straight away from uh, social change or activism-oriented pieces, mostly to appease the public. Um, if you see somebody holding a magazine that I don't know, has Hugh Jackman on the front, you're more likely to stop. Um, but we really see the value in archiving and publishing the community uh, perspective of different current events. Um, 2020 comes to mind uh, during the resurgence, or not resurgence, but the, the next phase of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, there was a, a big narrative uh, through mainstream media and while a lot of that information was true, it was not complete. Um, so we provided a different perspective, people on the ground, people that were in the protests, um, and people that were in, in the actual fight. You know, we're very on the ground writing. Um, of course, I am a paid journalist, um, but a lot of the pieces in our paper are just not written by journalists. They are written by people experiencing um, the realities of the American experience. And sometimes that does make our paper a little bit radical. Um, but if the truth is radical, then I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, what Gabby was referring to earlier, like the different um, kind of attitudes towards street vibes. Um, so that uh, what she's referring to is the entrepreneurial mo mm -hmm. model. Um, and that is most famously uh, followed by Big Issue, which is uh, distributed in the UK um, and Australia. Um, so basically what they're helping to do is to, to kind of run this sort of professionalization program. Uh, they're less concerned about like, you know, local issues or activist issues. They're really just basically trying to make people more professional and be able to transition into um, a different job market. And not that that isn't important, but um, here with Street Vibes, um, we've always kind of like, uh, just historically, Street Vibes has always uh, valued community voices more, more like local voices, something that will kind of push back and challenge the mainstream. Uh, so for example, um, actually a really um, notorious example uh, of this is uh, during the civil unrest, or what was also called the rebellion in 2001, after Timothy Thomas was killed, uh, Street Vibes, uh, the May 2001 issue, the, it was like the month after it happened, uh, published a lot of stories um, from people who were actually at the protests and saw you know, what was going on and you know, to, you know, told the reality of what was happening. And you know, there were some photos that would never get published in, say, the Cincinnati Inquirer. Um, if you were to look at the Cincinnati Inquirer from that time and to look at Street Vibes, you would get two completely different narratives. And they are going to interview completely different people. Mainstream news sor sources sort of like the Inquirer, and I'm not trying to throw them under the bus, maybe a little bit, but, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, they're, they're going to, they're going to um, be more likely to talk to people who are in some sort of like official authority or position of power. They're not necessarily going to talk to the person on the street who just got hit with a rubber bullet from a police officer trying to uh, quell what they think is a riot. 
Um, and so Street Vibes is going to do the exact opposite. They are going to talk to the people who were actually um, going to be really involved in it on the ground. Um, so yeah, that's how it's very, very different. Yeah, so um, a lot of times, so the 75 cents that I mentioned earlier, that's at cost. A lot of times the coalition loses money on Street Vibes and the extra papers go to educational events. Um, I probably should have brought some today, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> we have a lot of extras. They never go to waste though. Um, we, if we have a, a community engagement, we'll bring some. Um, but the community collaboration that Caitlin was mentioning really is real, the most important part of Street Fives, but also community presence. So showing up to those events, showing up to the protests, showing up as, um, as, a, as a resource for people to know that just because your voice is not amplified by the institution does not mean it's not a legitimate experience or a legitimate story. A lot of times we see uh, journalism or entertainment media deciding what is worth publishing, deciding uh, what we get to read, and then that di dictates our reality because we're not there at every moment of every day. Um, but if we're showing up, we build that trust with people to know that we are not going to override. We're not going to edit and just cross everything out. Um, the truth is the truth, uh, ugly, pretty as it can be. Um, but really showing up is, is important. So um, some of that also involves showing up for students. So we've given similar presentations to classrooms in UC, um, NKU, uh, Miami. Um, and a lot of those students are taking some sort of uh, community writing course. So sometimes they will share their pieces um, because we also don't believe in research living and dying in academia. It can live in, in other spaces, um, but we make sure that it's accessible, like legibly accessible, um, because sometimes there's jargon that not to call out the institution of academia. But sometimes it's difficult for the layman's person to, to, to read that. Like, why, why does this relate to the person down the street? Well, actually, it's really important. Kind of how everybody on the panel has said already, um, a lot of this is intersectional. A lot of issues that exist in the world, in our community, um, they overlap and they come from the same problem, uh, but the symptoms are different. So if there's research that is being done academically, we want to make sure that the public is, has access to that as well and it's not through a paywall. Yeah, and that's how Street Fives has a very democratic function because it's making sure that all voices are heard and distributed. Mm -hmm. And we also do um, not just regular uh, writing essays. We also do uh, photo essays if we have that opportunity. Um, and if somebody comes to us with a project and they're like, I don't really know how this would fit with Street Vibes, again, collaboration, community, we're willing to sit down with that person and uh, really figure out how we can help each other. Um, if you would like to talk about the archive. Yes, so um, through our collaboration, because Gabby and I work very closely with each other and have for, well, basically since she took the helm as editor in 2018. Um, so, you know, her, like her access and like her, you know, to uh, like certain like uh, issues, like things at the coalition were definitely what helped me build the archive. Um, one thing that I found somewhat frustrating is that um, when I was um, asked to be on the committee for the community book that Brian was talking about earlier, um, they were, you know, we, we were looking for these specific Street Vibes issues and we could not find them. Um, and I thought, well, that's a huge access problem. So um, I sort of said, kind of like half joking, you know, I'm just going to make an archive and store everything. And well, here we are. I wrote a whole dissertation about it. <laughs> um, so, um, but yeah, uh, so it was really like working with Gabby and knowing kind of like what Street Vibes values, um, you know, that helped me kind of figure out like how to organize the archive and what should be highlighted. And so some things that I'm going to be working on are like kind of exhibiting and like highlighting certain issues that are very important to the community, uh, like how affordable housing and gentrification are reflected in street vibes. Um, 
So, you know, because I feel like the archive and Street Vibes can be used as a very valuable tool in community um, education. Um, you know, Bonnie was talking a lot about how, you know, there's been a lot of development in Northern Rhine that's been very detrimental for a lot of people. And Street Vibes, I think, can kind of, like the archive can help um, track that. Um, but yeah, I, like Gabby helped me find issues that I couldn't find. Um, she helped me kind of figure out like how to certain, we're gonna work out like certain difficult problems I was having. Um, and really just, you know, like, she, you know, she comes from a non, you know, like she, she, she was able to give me the perspective of someone who is not an academic because we academics, like we tend to um, think of things in sort of ways that are probably a little too abstract. And so a lot of times Gabby brings me down to earth. And uh, that's kind of one of the things that really, really works about having these collaborations and having this collaborative work. So. Yeah, my experience, um, my educational experience is actually just in media and documentary screenwriting. Um, but I had a really large um, activist career in uh, college, as many of us do. Um, but I didn't start in uh, college doing activism. In high school, um, I actually was involved with the Homeless Coalition. Uh, not, I wasn't aware when I applied to the job um, that there was actually that connection. It wasn't until I walked into the building and I was like, I have been here before. <laughs> um, but in high school, I worked with uh, City Gospel and um, we did a photography program. So um, I've always seen over the Rhine um, for the multitude of experiences that it has. Um, so that really, I think gave me a leg up to get this get this job because it's actually it's quite a large feat to do and I am quite young so um, having the archive to provide context more on top of like what I've already experienced what I already know of the community um, is incredibly important and that's reflected in our pieces as well um, in 2001 I was five years old so what could I what could I have really known and taken from that but 2001 really gave us a lot of context for 2020 um, and I'm sure many other uh, cities have had that same experience of uh, sometimes history rhymes in a way that is painful. Um, it makes us realize, wow, how are we here again? Um, but in a bright, on a brighter note, it also helps activists not reinvent the wheel. They can see in the archive, okay, where was the struggle? Where did we fail? Um, where did we persevere? Where did we win? And people of another generation can see that and not waste time trying to get city council on our side because they're just not going to. Um, and there's other avenues, there's other ways of, uh, of building coalition and that all lives in the paper. Um, and that's true for a lot of other papers. Um, Toledo comes to mind, has a paper that's very similar. Um, so that's how the archive still lives in our um, print today. Um, it and amplifies voices. Yeah, if you take nothing else from our presentation is that amplifying voices is the, is the most important part of uh, Street Vibes. And we also have a writing circle that actually you, you were a part of before I even started <laughs> at um, the coalition. Um, that's where people would come and either have um, their oral stories uh, transcribed for them or um, Sometimes we, it was just ended up being kind of like communal therapy. I mean, Miss June knows. We would sit down and be like, you know what sucks? And we're like, what sucks? Tell us. Um, so just having that space um, as writers and as creatives to uh, express our frustrations and maybe put it down on paper or maybe just let it out for that moment, um, those spaces are really important. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I was waiting for you. Um, yes, so um, some things that we are working on or that I'm going to be working on in the future are, um, as I was talking about earlier, I would like to highlight certain topics and kind of talk about how they have developed over time to sort of uh, inform some of the work that we are doing today. Um, I know I, you know, when we were um, in the fight for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which, well, I guess that's still a that's still an ongoing thing. Um, I was able to find a lot of things um, in the archive that kind of spoke to a lot of the, so basically like a lot of the things that we are struggling with now, we've been struggling with for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and the archive sort of helped give me perspective on that. Um, so I would like to be able to kind of um, exhibit that more as, so that people who are visiting the archive can also see it. 
Um, but yeah, there are many different functions I think um, the archive could do um, in the future, just, like with, you know, within classrooms, within activist circles, um, within communities, and, um, and that is an ongoing process. And we're also, um, since I started uh, working at uh, Street Vibes, um, I began incorporating um, like uh, Black History Month, Women's History Month, um, Native American History Month, et cetera, et cetera, um, to really have those um, voices really have a, a, a spotlight on them. And uh, the special editions tend to sell better, which obviously our um, main <laughs> purpose for existing is uh, to provide that income, that extra income for people experiencing homelessness or are on the edge of experiencing homelessness. Um, so having something that people can see and it doesn't feel, because activism can kind of feel a little daunting to people who are like, I'm not political. And it's like, if you exist on earth, you have to be political um, because this really is important to you. So it's seeing something that we're all used to that has been in our classrooms has been really um, a good way to dip new toes into the waters. Yes. Um, but hopefully that'll continue in the future. That's that. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. I am known as Miss June. Roots. When you ask us about our roots, the first thing in my mind was my hair. Instantly, the smell of heat and grease came to mind. Roots conjured up images of a child's straw bottom chair and family voices. When I was young, my hair was long and my mother washed it every Saturday to get ready for Sunday and the school week to come. In some strange adult way, this was entertainment for my daddy. He would come into the kitchen and tease me. It hurt to have my mother comb out my hair. Sit still, mama yelled. Hold your ear so I don't burn it. All this and daddy's teasing made me cry harder. He didn't have to go through this girl torture. Stop. I screamed. That only led my grandmother to chime in. Make sure you get deep down to her roots. Make sure those roots are good and straight. Years later, Black Pride, Dr. King, Power Signs, and our roots personified by the Afro. Unfortunately, the Afro was not meant for me. The Afro became another symbol of my roots awakening. The Afro was proud like the Black South power sign. It stood high, which was more than I could say for my hair. It just curled up or fell back down to my shoulders. On a day, on a good day, I could manage to look like an electrocuted porcupine. Of course, well-meaning elders, you can't do that. You got good hair. Many years later, I was in college away from my mother's hot combs, so I decided to have a relaxer put in my hair against wise counsel. I went to a beauty parlor and got myself a relaxer. After all, I was paying for this with my own money, and it was with more of my money that I had to pay a doctor to tell me why my hair fell out. My roots landed me at the white beauty shop. In her deep southern accent, the hairdresser asked carefully, baby, who your people? Who your folks? At first, I didn't answer. Or better yet, I suddenly developed that great American disease, denial. She made a shield with her body against the other patrons and held my face in her hands. As discreetly and as compassionately as she could, she asked, baby, how much white people in you? <laughs> All I could do was laugh. I replied according to my great, great aunts. Our family didn't turn black until 1952. <laughs> she mellowed and continued to treat my scalp and leftover hair. All the while, she kept talking about how I couldn't do my hair like other black girls 
and it ain't how light the skin is that always tells the mixture, it's other things, and so on and so forth. Her account of black and white mixing and back in the day when people were passing faded into another awakening. It turned into my grandfather who looked like an old version of Sean Connery and my grandmother's dark skin. My granddaddy's pain of being neither here nor there. His pain of knowing his white cousins lived just across the street and it couldn't be acknowledged until death tornadoed into his painful discovery about his brother being taken from him because he had dark skin. My grandmother's constant battle with self-image because she came from slaves and field hands and dark skin and coarse hair. My grandmother's every, every moment trying to prove she was just as good as the more educated, light-skinned, skinned, upper class relatives on my grandfather's side of the family. My grandmother's self-hatred turned into poison. Watching a once loving woman become evil and bitter because she looked more like Hattie McDaniel than Halle Berry. Watching this hate break my granddaddy's heart knowing there was nothing he could do to change the world. All that gave me pain. Roots, how dare you ask me about my roots? Is this your idea of a cr some cruel and twisted joke? You know about my roots. You took them from me. Just like that hot comb, you, your heated disdain and hatred for us burned and destroyed my roots, my soul, my light, and my compass. You took all that from me. The extinguishing was the reason my aunts and my mothers tried to hide me, because we were witches and healers like our ancestors, just like the torture of straightening my hair was to make me more comfortable to white people. Straightened out or white out my roots. You took our art music, even our religion away from us. And if that wasn't enslaving enough, you lied about Egypt, the Bible, classical music, even art. We were all there from the very beginning. We were there. You took my soul. You took our souls. And then you want to, to know why we act the way we do? What did you expect? We were going to all become black kin and Barbie dolls? And integration, the same lie you told the Native Americans and the Aborigines. You didn't want to integrate. You wanted to annihilate. But it didn't take. It can't take. And so here we are all living in a cauldron of lies and curses. You stripped us of everything that made us human. Our healers, our teachers, our witches, our religions, and our earth. And you wonder why we, we're all living in a wasteland of broken promises and brainless autocrats. But the joke is on you. Look at your own children killing themselves to achieve an unnatural standard of beauty, life, and success all the while killing your own with a religion filled full of hate and bigotry. Deciding who can love and who is worthy to pursue happiness. No, no, the joke is on you because now your children are living in, we are all lost in addictions, medications, gentrification, and unjust affiliations, with no hope of being human or humane. Again, we are all now living in this. <laughs> it's getting kind of hot down here, isn't it? <laughs> you see, I'm not the only one whose roots have been straight. which is, there they were thrown on my front porch every summer, 
selling peas, snapping beans. There they were in bright big dresses, yellows, reds, blues, purples, oranges, greens. Dresses dancing around over the overly large, abundant, baby-producing hips. Dresses rocking, molding, and cradling the curves of breasts made to feed nations. There they were, sitting on my front porch, preparing for winter, preparing for harvest, preparing for whatever storm was going to come. Beautiful, radiant women with raisin and cocoa skin, red and purples dancing around their cheeks and eyes. They laugh, watching the many children dodge the bees, skin their knees and grin at each other, trying so hard to please. They sit on the porch, fire, water, earth, wind, and spirit, keeping the world turning, growing, cleansing, and just being, all knowing. They give birth, life, and call down sweet chariot while gently singing the dying into the river. All the while their chairs, their thrones, rocking sorrow away and giving rhythm to joy. With each moment of life calling up and gathering up the song comes the shout. It starts with the lap of an apron of peas leaping into the atmosphere, bowls overturned, clanging their symphonic introduction into existence. And in unison with the freedom of the peas, the women dance their souls out of their bodies like rainbow wells on emerald seas. Free, free, free from the bondage society can hold, overlapping choruses of how I got over. Nobody knows an amazing grace drumming out of the wooden plank porch. A symphony of aged bare feet, a ballet of earthly round bodies painting God's grace. They think of the times when there were no peas, no beans, no food to share. They remember when they could not own their own houses, their own lives, their own bodies, or even their own dreams. And the screams, the weldings, the wellings crescendo into an opera of thank you, Jesus. Lord have mercy and glory, 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 hallelujah. One day, one very holy day, if I am blessed and awakened, resurrected and taken, I too will sit with those five wise women, the witches. Slowly, I'm reaching for the, that porch so high, that porch uh, almost level to the sky, where old is beautiful, and fat means harvest, and wolves and pigs are both in vogue. One day, if I keep my broom handy, ready to clean my water shoulda couldas away, making my hearth a place for all to feed, to be comforted, and to teach many nations to laugh, all of us, at the storms and to cry at the sun, to nurse the moon with my own internal light. One day, I too will be a praying witch. I too can say to God in confidence and strength, you promised. I want my big flowing dress, my rock, my large bag for healing and concealing the emptiness that brings apathy and war. I want to use the fat of my body to draw out and hold chaos and poison and gently return them clean and whole as flowers and trees. I want my body filled with every creature, light and the dark. I want to sit, to sit in, on a porch and see my children my children filled with love so they can not help but to walk justice. 
Eat justice. Breathe just justice. Teach justice and give peace. I want to be that witch, that woman, that elder, that wise crone filled with all my colors, sitting on that porch, rocking with the white painted clapboard behind me is my halo, shelling peas, snapping beans to share. The only thing I have to say is amen. amen. Wow, um, what a hard act to um, follow. That was amazing. Um, it was um, so relatable and so powerful. So um, yeah, so I'm gonna pause for a second. Um, so as Dr. Wilkie mentioned earlier, um, my name is Janai Miller. I'm a 2020 graduate of Northern Kentucky University. So I graduated uh, five weeks uh, um, after the pandemic started. Um, so it's already been um, a quick two years since the start of it. Um, and since my work within the program and with the Miami Center, I've continued in the community. Um, so I'll just briefly talk about what that looks like and what that um, meant for me. So I took the Writing for Social Change course Dr. Wilkie mentioned um, back in, I believe, the fall of 2018, um, where I was able to meet writers like um, Miss June and hear similar stories. Um, I was able to learn what it meant to be um, immersed in a community and think thoroughly about what it meant to preserve writing because the um, ethnography, especially of black people and of black women, often aren't preserved or valued in the um, sense of knowledge production and scholarship. So to sit there and to be surrounded by people in the community who um, were sharing um, a different narrative that is often pushed back against, I thought was very impactful. So I had wrote my first article and it was published in Street Vibes um, during Black History Month edition um, that following year. Um, and it focused on the impact of gentrification and what that meant um, for me and my family and what I um, believed it to be. Um, and one of the things that I want to point out and remember from that article is really like, um, you can't move people around like they're cattle as if they um, needed to, need to be herded um, somewhere else uh, um, because you now find value in a space uh, that they are in that you once didn't. Um, and so since that class, I continued to write. In that following um, year, I was the first NKU student to participate in the Miami residency program. Um, um, I also had a semester long internship at the Greater Cincinnati Homeless Coalition where I worked um, on educational outreach uh, um, during that time and then continued through the next semester, although that wasn't a stipulation um, of the program. Um, so I'm gonna get into the presentation now. Um, I think we've all seen this picture today. So, um, as I, after that year and after I graduated, I continued to stay involved with the Greater Cincinnati Homeless Coalition. And about, uh, in a year ago this week, uh, um, I um, joined their team as an AmeriCorps VISTA community organizing, 
Community Organizer, which is um, a federally funded program that focuses on the preservation um, of housing, housing, particularly in Section 8. So um, as uh, Gabby and Dr. Wilkie mentioned um, earlier, is that you know we're still in the midst of getting funding for the affordable housing campaign. And as I grew in this space, I really realized that um, policy was something that was also important to me too, and bridging that gap um, when we think about community writing and again, how we produce knowledge and how, how we frame out issues. Because as um, mentioned earlier, you know, qualitative analysis, um, meaning the, ex the lived experiences of people often um, are not valued and often are not centered. Um, quantitative um, analysis, so data-driven research, is often what is at the center. And so for me and the work that I do, I'm always trying to center the people who are most impacted, um, which as mentioned, are people who are on the economic margins, but also to take it a step further, um, black women are most disproportionately impacted by housing inequities with this um, country next to black transgender women um, and indigenous women and, and, and Latinas. Um, so during my time there after this campaign for this trust fund, we wanted to keep the momentum going and really think more deeply about what did it what does it mean to engage black and brown people um, within the city so through this and through community conversations we formed the people power committee last summer which the purpose uh, was to build power among people across the greater Cincinnati region as we seek to address these issues. Our intention was to use an intersectional framework that allows for marginally oppressed people to be centered in decision-making processes to advance housing equality within their communities as they are experts in their own lives. Often this dominating narrative um, implies that they aren't experts, that they cannot uh, be that, that they cannot contribute to um, you know a solution and that's really far from the truth I don't think the people that put them there in the first place should be at the center of those discussions right which is the institution because another thing that uh, was really critical in my understanding and education is really understanding that you know these problems we're facing are a government made problem they're not a people made problem um, and that is a historical fact. Um, so we also saw outside of engaging people with lived experience, organizations in the community who are doing this work to further strengthen our base um, because they're also important in advancing it because they have resources and they also have um, their own base of people that they're connecting with. For example, um, homeless shelters. Um, and so ultimately the committee's goal was to work to build a movement that represents a diverse multi-generational group of individuals within our region. And as I just read off of that um off of that uh, slide, we did work with a lot of people across generations. So um, me as someone who um, is young, I'm 23 years old, you know, that is like the biggest thing is being able to sustain work and engage people um, across regions because, uh, not across regions, across generations, because it can be very um, challenging at times to encompass a multitude um, of perspectives, uh, uh, across generations. And so what that meant and looks like um, was really able, really being able to dig deeper into the understanding of all types of people. And so instead of saying this work was um, you know, sponsored, which is typically what we use when people support it. There wasn't really a monetary um, goal. There wasn't really um, a monetary connection to this. Um, we called the individuals and entities that we worked with community collaborators. So in this action particularly, um, 
Leading up to it, we spent the summer canvassing and going to different community events to build awareness around these issues. And then our committee decided to focus on the Cincinnati City Council race, which was the largest city council race in the city um, in the past 30 years. There were 35 candidates who ran and that last cycle there was 18 ran and they're all vying for um, nine seats, which would be at large. Also, what was different about this election is that the Democratic Party endorsed um, nine candidates as well. So um, that was uh, that uh, was an entire thing within itself. And so with that, we had 25 out of the 35 candidates participate in um, in this forum, which uh, goes to show the work of the ballot measure really impacted the community, really began to push back on um, a dominate, uh, the dominating narrative uh, um, that was being said, uh, that, that is had around housing. So um, through that, we surveyed the community, again, bringing it back to the community. Um, and then ultimately after this, we published um, Cincinnati's first housing justice voter empowerment guide with questions that directly represented the voices of the community. We did a Street Vibe special edition, which brought in five new writers um, across different generations and lived experiences. Uh, um, and so here you can see some of the events that we had. Again, um, community dialogue and ethnography is not just had in academia, but it's also had um, in video and through oral history. Um, and so, yeah, these were the candidates. Um, I will try to maybe, no, I won't do that. But basically you can find this guide um, online and you can see what it looks like. So again, all of this was birthed out of this idea of community writing and centering people's voices who are directly impacted and not just focusing on sending this guide out in a traditional sense, but also the distribution was um, coordinated with people who were directly working with individuals who had this lived experience. So they were one engaged in the voting process, but their concerns were met as well because their, again, voices were reflected in the several questions we asked uh, candidates. Um, so again, people who supported us and that is some of the work that I did and I continue to do. I'll be publishing um, a blog series focusing on the closure of City Heights in Covington, Kentucky, the largest public housing complex um, within the region, among other work that centers the housing experiences of black girls and women. Um, so thanks for coming today, you guys. Thanks, Janai, and really thank all of you uh, for how you value community voices, which I think is the message tonight. I really appreciate that. Let's give them one more round of applause. Uh, <clears throat> we are uh, uh, running a little short on time, but there are two questions uh, from the virtual audience. Uh, uh, one um, is uh, Bonnie and Miss June. Um, the audience wants you to be sure and write your uh, stories in this community. Once the community press is going, they want the autobiography of June and Bonnie. So uh, let's pledge to that now, huh? Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, Caitlin, a question on the archives. Uh, uh, someone asked, uh, will it be uh, searchable, a, a digital source, uh, searchable base? Because uh, we really want to know a little more specifics about access to it. Yes, I'm so sorry. Um, I, that was something that I was going to add. I was going to add to the uh, slideshow, and I totally spaced on it. I'm so sorry. Um, yes, it is. Um, it can be found online pretty easily, um, and it is searchable. Um, the URL is um, s v archive a r c h i v e dot omeka o m e k a dot net and if you forget that you can also go to um since street vibes.com yeah which i would actually make more sense because yeah. i don't expect it in a, i think you could also 
I think you can just go to Google and type in Street Vibes Archives. Uh, and I think there's like a million. Anyway, yeah. If you if you if you really want it, Google will help you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yes, it is it is searchable. Um, it is available. Um, I do have a search bar available on there. Um, I only have issues from '97 to 2019 right now. Uh, the project in the summer is to get it caught up to the present. Mm -hmm. all, all the um, articles that we publish in Street Vibes are put on the website um, about a month, two months afterwards. Um, so if something's not on the archive, it, it probably will yeah. be in, on the live site. And that also is searchable with tags, um, also like search bar and everything. Um, but I think yours as well, the archive, you can click on different yeah. um, topics. You can find some of them now, and it's going to get even better. So <laughs> <laughs> is there a burning question in the audience that anybody wants to ask? Um, if not, I, one thing I'd like to do is thank the Norse media team, which uh, uh, is broadcasting this. So our virtual audience is uh, seeing this thanks to North, Norse media. These are students. This is the career they are training for. And as it turns out, uh, uh, it's an expertise that uh, is going to be needed uh, because uh, the, uh, in the uh, real world, world of broadcast, they weren't really ready for the pandemic either. But we're going to graduate students who are especially talented in this. Thank you also again to the Kentucky Humanities uh, for the support tonight and for the support for the, uh, the Poet Laureates. Hope you can join us for that. This is the 50th year of Kentucky Humanities bringing programming like this in support of the arts. Um, and so uh, it's a special um, uh, anniversary for um, that uh, a fine organization. Uh, just quickly in reflection, uh, the uh, uh, June, uh, I just want to particularly say all, everybody's comments were uh, remarkable, but uh, just the, the beauty and honesty of your uh, remarks and, and, the, and the, uh, the way as a writer that you're able to combine uh, 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 anger and outrage with kindness is kind of a remarkable <laughs> to uh, mm -hmm. be a, a witness of. So thank you. And uh, uh, Gabby, I really loved uh, just in reflecting a statement that you made, if the truth is radical, and I don't know what to tell you. So uh, <laughs> thank you for that. And uh, Bonnie, I uh, just uh, want to say that you're a, lots of uh, a beauty in, in what you read to us. But I liked uh, particularly that I want our people to be touched by kindness. And I'm not sure that I got this exactly right, but there is an art of uh, uh, an act of wisdom in the seating. Uh, so thank you for those. And I hope uh, that uh, this year and our, uh, our focus uh, on uh, democracy and community that we've planted some seeds and perhaps show a path toward kindness in our public discourse. So thanks, everybody, for being with us. Good night. Thank you.